Okay, this next lecture is going to be on vascular, cardiac, and interventional radiography. So first thing that we're going to talk about a little bit of the history. So uh, first contrast procedure was demonstrated uh, the vessels of an amputated hand, which is actually kind of cool. Um, they use a chalk-based contrast, and they did this just like 10 weeks after Rankin announced his discovery of x-rays. So that's pretty cool. I can't imagine how long that exposure was. So the progression of angio was hindered by the lack of safe contrast media. So in the 1920s, they used the sodium iodide, and the 20, 1929, the first human cardiac catheterization was performed, and um, he performed it on himself, which is actually really cool. In 1952, um, this Selinger uh, percutaneous technique uh, came into play and we still use that technique today. So the circulatory system has two complex systems. One is the blood vascular system and one is the lymphatic. So they both carry oxygen and nutrient, nutritive material to the tissues. They also collect and transport carbon dioxide and other me uh, metabolic waste to organs of excretion. So the blood vascular system consists of the heart, arteries, capillaries, veins. All this should be reviewed for you, so I'm going to go through it really fast. The heart, as you know, pumps the blood throughout the bodies. The areas carry oxygenated blood away from the heart. Veins carry blood back to the heart that's deoxygenated. The heart has two circulation circuits. So there's the systemic and the pulmonary system. The systemic uh, circulation carries oxygenated blood to the organs and tissues. The pulmonary circulation takes blood to the lungs in exchange for carbon dioxide for oxygen. So then it carries the oxygenated blood uh, from the lungs to the heart for the systemic circulation. So the two main uh, trunk vessels arise from the heart are the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. So the aorta comes off the um, left ventricle and it begins a systemic circulation where the pulmonary trunk is the branch that begins at um, the pulmonary circulation comes off the right ventricle. So the systemic circulation, aorta exits the left ventricle of the heart, arteries are the main branch of the aorta, it's usually named by the location, there's arterioles, uh, which is a smaller branch of arteries, there's capillaries, and venules, uh, lastly. So a vein is a larger vessel for returning blood to the heart, it usually lies uh, parallel to the main artery in and carries the same name, so there's the superior and inferior vena cava. Um, they are the primary largest veins. They return the systemic blood back to the right atrium. And um, the portal system is the pathway for venous drainage from the abdominal organs through the liver uh, before returning to the inferior vena cava. So that kind of washes the blood of the toxins to be excreted. So here's a picture of the circulatory system. Okay, the heart. It is your central organ of blood vascular system. It has four chambers, two atria, two ventricles, and it's divided by a centrum, a centrum, a septum. There is the myocardium, endocardium, epicardium, and the pericardial sac. So know what different layers those are. There is the atria, which is the upper receiving chambers, and there's the ventricle, which is the lower distributing chambers. So um, there's the right arterial vent ventricular valve or tricuspid valve, and then there's the left AV valve or mitral valve. So you can see how the blood flows through the heart. You should already know this and be able to trace a red blood cell coming in to the uh, from the inferior superior vena cava into the right atrium and follow it all the way through to the descending aorta. All right, so um, the right side of the heart handles venous or deoxygenated blood, where the left side handles oxygenated blood. The coronary arteries are what supply blood and nutrients to the myocardium of the heart. And you can see here um, we have the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, and we have the pulmonaries here, pulmonary artery, pulmonary veins, and then we have the left coronary artery. 
and the right coronary artery and then it branches and branches. So the left coronary artery is the big one. It's called the Widowmaker. You get a block in that and you go down. The likelihood that we're going to be able to save you is grim. Okay, so now on the lymphatic system, there's two communicating sets. There's the superficial and the deep. The collecting, they collect fluid from the tissue spaces and transports it to the blood or vascular system. It doesn't have a pumping system like the heart. It's just the movement occurs intrinsic from intrinsically from pressure in surrounding organs and muscles and valves prevent the backflow into them. So nodes, they converge at convergence locations for connecting vessels may occur um, singly but they're usually in chains or in groups. Um, it's rare to have just one single lymph node. They're usually in a track or a group and they can range from 2 to 20. They can also vary in size. So when you're sick, they get really big, the size of an almond, and you, like in your neck, if you feel behind your jaw, you can feel the lymph nodes in there. And they're usually enlarged, especially if you have sinus issues like I do. They'll always be enlarged and a little tender if you push on them. Um, the lymph nodes in your chest, if you are sick or have pneumonia, of course, they're going to be larger. And we watch for that on a chest x-ray. But they should be the size of a pinhead. And some people just have larger lymph nodes, like my dog. She's a Vishla, and she has, historically, Vishlas have had larger lymph nodes than other dogs, which is very odd. So, just depends on you, I guess. There is the thoracic duct, which is the terminal main trunk of the lymphatic system. So, here's your lymphatic system. As you can see, there are lymph nodes all over your body, and they get enlarged depending on illness. Or disease. So, blood vascular system definitions and indications. So, if we look at the definitions for angiography, it's a general term referred to radiologic examination of vascular structures after the induction introduction of contrast medium. There's um, arteriography refers to an examination of the arteries with contrast. Uh, venography refers to um, study of the veins after a contrast injection. So indications. We use it to identify anatomy or pathology of blood vessels, um, claudication, so leg pain or cramping, stenosis of a vessel, usually from atherosclerosis, occlusion of a vessel, so complete blockage of a vessel, usually from atherosclerosis, and we look for aneurysm, which is a weakening in the wall of the artery, which causes a ballooning um, of that artery and it becomes very weak and can rupture. So we also look for tumors and any kind of um, variance within um, the vessel. So you could have um, a cluster of vessels, um, a vas or vascular malformations where they're all bundled together. Um, there's a lot of different things that we look for. So vascular procedures, we use contrast, and we use injectors, and we use catheters, and there's set procedures typically that we do. The contrast that we use nowadays is non-ionic. We don't use water soluble anymore typically. It's all non-ionic as we have less reactions and it's easier on the kidneys for patients. So we use a power injector typically, and we have um, we adjust the rate. Sometimes we have it uh, start off slow and we increase the rate um, and then we'll chase it with saline so that we can cut down the dose. So we don't typically do manual injections anymore. It's too inconsistent. So we need a real consistent injection for these studies to work out well. The equipment that we use, um, we usually use subtraction technology. Um, where it'll take away everything but the contrast in the vessel. So all the vascular and muscles and everything else is subtracted out. It's wiped away from the image and only the contrast um, vessel will be shown. So really cool um, subtraction is the way to go. Um, Cine is still used in... Um, when we're doing cardiac casts, or basically anything that we're doing, we'll run Cine and we can play loop so it's like a movie. And we can play it over and over and over so we can have it looped so the doctor can see it multiple times, fill it with contrast and wash out with contrast, fill with contrast, wash out with contrast so that they can figure out exactly what they're going to do. Um, we don't use film changers anymore, uh, really old and out of date. 
um, not good in cardiac catheterization. Okay, so um, catheters are usually really small. They're really flexible. If you can go into a IR suite or cardiac uh, cath lab and ask them to see a catheter, um, a lot of times they uh, soak them in saline and they have wires within them so that they can guide them exactly where they want to go. Um, advantages is um, there's a lot of them. So they're flexible when we're positioning them. They're safe to be left in the body. Um, low risk of esterization. So anyway, um, using the um, Sillinger technique, it's most widely used. It's performed under sterile conditions and the catheters are made in variety of sizes and shapes depending on what we are going in and doing. So if we're going to be deploying stents and doing all kinds of work, we may go with a larger one. Or if we're just going in and doing a what we call a run, where we're just injecting contrast just to diagnose, not to treat. Um, we'll use smaller, so depending on what we're doing. Now, patient care is really important when we're working in these areas. The patients are there because they're sick, so um, then we're sticking things inside their arterial venous system that's not supposed to be there. So if we puncture through an artery, we will notice changes in the patient's um, monitors. So we're going to be able to tell by their heart rate, their blood pressure, everything else. So we pay attention to that. It's very, very important that you have provide good patient care for these patients. So it's process and potential complications must be explained to the patient prior to doing it. You need to get written consent. Um, you need to restrict clear fluids um, unless, of course, it's an emergency. We do it anyway. We don't care. And we warn the patients typically they're sedated where they just don't care um, they're awake. We can talk to the patients and tell them, hey, you're going to feel some heat. That's normal. You know, when the contract comes, contrast is being injected. Um, so we'll explain to the patients what's going on. And we usually give them something so they don't remember what, what happened to them. So the complications are vasovagal uh, reaction from the contrast. They could have a stroke um, from what we're doing. They could have a heart attack from what we're doing. They could die on the table and this has happened. They're coming in and typically they're having a heart attack while we're working on them and sometimes we can't survive. We can't keep the patient alive and let them survive. They do die in these departments. So they can bleed at the puncture site. Um, nerve or vessel or tissue damage, we can actually perforate the vessel or we can damage a nerve. Um, during ablations, um, the vagus nerve has been um, ablated when it wasn't supposed to be and the patient's on a vent for the rest of their life. So there's complications um, with any kind of contrast that we inject also. So before the patient arrives, you clean and prep the room, you check the equipment, make sure it works, set the exposure techniques, check the crash cart, make sure it works because um, at my hospital that I was at the last few actually, in um, cardiac cath lab, we weren't allowed to call a code because you have a, a cardiologist in the room and you have a full team, you have all the drugs, you have your crash cart, you have to handle your own code. There's no one else that's going to respond that can do a better job than the team that's already in there. So kind of interesting, you'll want to find out if you're going to be going in there and doing observations if they are able to call a code or not. So some facilities, um, some places I've been, yep, cardiac cath lab, you call a code and everyone comes rushing in. Um, other facilities I've worked at, nope, they handle their own codes. So it's it's interesting um, talking to the techs on, on the stress of that, that they have to handle their own code. So pretty stressful. All right. So radiation protection is still really, really important. We're using really long um, exposures on these patients so the floor time is really high it's not uncommon to go 10 minutes it's not uncommon to go 20 minutes it's not uncommon to have an hour so you need to make sure that you're moving the C arm around so it's not going through the patient in the same spot every single time um, you will burn the tissue um, you can cause necrosis all kinds of good stuff so if you're having a really long exam make sure you move move the uh, C arm around so it's not going in the patient in the same spot so you want to collimate to the area and you want to use proper exposure techniques. Um, you need to communicate with everyone to avoid any kind of repeat runs. 
So if you repeat, um, it's extra dose for the technologist, the doctor, everyone else in the room along with the patient. And um, longer we're in there and more contrast we give, the more of a chance there is for an adverse reaction, which is just not good. So the team, it's a physician. It's usually a cardiologist that's in there or an interventional radiologist. Um, um, a lot of them on, at least in cath lab, they're going to a cardiac electrophysiologist. They're going to an, an, an invasive cardiologist or an inventional radiologist. So um, a lot of different people can be doing these exams and we will work for all of them. So a CIT is a cardiac cardiovascular interventional technologist and then you can have an anesthesiologist, you can have radiology nurses, you can have all kinds of people in there in addition. Um, if you're putting in pacemakers, you'll have someone like my daughter working for St. Jude or Medtronic and they'll be in there programming um, while you're implanting the pacemaker. So you'll have those people in there also and make sure you protect them um, that they're not standing in a high dose area because they don't know anything about radiation so it's your job to make sure that they are safe. So, um, your aortography, so there's thoracic and abdominal, there's um, pulmonary, art arteriography, and there's select abdominal visceral um, arteriography. So, um, there's also central venography, select visceral venography, peripheral, they're cerebral, and we're going to talk a little bit about each. I'm not going to go into big detail because um, it's just dependent on your site and the equipment that you have, so um, you'll have to find out the protocols. So for thoracic, the purpose is we're ruling out aortic aneurysm, we're looking at congenital or post-surgical changes, and we're looking at dissection, aortic dissection, that's pretty scary. Um, biplane is best, you want to do a PA and a lateral or an AP and a lateral at the, you know, at the same time, um, and usually we're centered to T7. Uh, injection rate it depends on your doctor and how big your catheters are. There's a lot of different things. So vessels demonstrated, we look at the thoracic aorta, proximal um, brachiocephalic, and the proximal carotid. So the purpose of the abdominal um, is to look at look for aneurysm, inclusion, atherosclerosis disease, and also we want an AP and a lateral projection um, at the same time. Um, these biplanes are really, really nice because it does an AP and lateral at the same time. Instead of doing AP run, turn it lateral, doing a lateral run, you can do biplane and get them both at the same time, which is really cool. Um, you usually center around L2. Vessels uh, demonstrate an AP, we look at the aorta um, from diaphragm to bifurcation, we look at the renals, um, we look at the bifurcation, and just the general condition of uh, the branches. In the lateral, we're looking at the celiac and the superior mesenteric. We also will look at the inferior mesenteric and make sure that that's intact. So pulmonary. We evaluate uh, evaluation of the pulmonary embolotic disease, so we do AP and oblique projections with the biplane, and we look at the left pulmonary arteries, left atrium, left ventricle, and your thoracics. Um, we also look at tumor vascularity, so we rule out atherosclerosis, thrombosis, occlusion, and bleeding. And the CR entrance point depends on what we're looking at. So um, all here's all the different places that you would center. I'm not going to go over all of this because it's just what something that you're going to learn while you're on the job. So when we're looking at the abdominal and we're looking at the celiac, um, we care about it because there's three arteries that supply um, the stomach and the liver and the spleen and so we look at that we'll look at the renal and make sure the right and left um, renals are intact and they're not occluded uh, we have a lot of uncontrolled blood pressure from renal stenosis so really important that we look at those renals and get a good shot of them all right so we also can do upper and lower limb angiography so we can rule out occlusions or thrombosis or traumatic injury lesions everything so we can do lower limb. Also, we do a lot of these for um, deep vein thrombosis, so which will give you pulmonary embolisms. So it's important that we take a look at those and we put in filters to break up um, those big old blood clots in the venous system. 
Um, so cerebral, angio. So we look at the anatomy, we're gonna look at the purpose and the injection rate. So um, there's the brain is supplied by four vessels. So there's the right and left common uh, carotid, so there's the anterior circulation, the right and left vertebral arteries, which is your posterior circulation. So your common carotid arteries branch into the internal and external around C4, so it's like three to four. Um, internal carotids enter the brain through the carotid foramen of the temporal bone. And we have the internal carotids bifurcate into anterior middle cerebral arteries, and these branch again uh, to supply anterior circulation to respected hemispheres of right and left. So your vertebral arteries ascend through the transverse foramen of the cervical uh, vertebra and enter the cranium through the foramen magnum. So these vessels unite to form the basilar artery. So the, the basilar bifurcates into right and left posterior cerebral arteries and the anterior and posterior cerebral arteries connect by communicating arteries to the midbrain level of the circle of Willis, and that's in the ambient fissure. So the purpose, we investigate intracranial vascular lesions such as aneurysms, AVMs, which is avas arterial venous malformations, tumors, atherosclerosis, and stenosis. So um, we will look at the, the aortic arch in a biplane, we'll do AP and lateral, and then um, We'll do oblique, and that's a 35 degree RPO, and the chin is elevated to make sure that the mandible isn't in our area of interest. And here, um, for anterior circulation of the brain, we want lateral. Here's all the different views. Um, I'm not gonna go over them in too much because um, you have to be able to just do it. So this is circulation of the head. So for a lateral, you want the head vertical uh, to the IR, and you want your IOML perpendicular to the horizontal plane and your MSP vertical. So here's your AP axial. You're going to do 20 degrees caudad uh, with the line passing three-quarter inch superior to parallel the line extending from the superorbital, three-quarter inch superior to the external EAM. So holy moly, here's an oblique on what you're going to do and you're gonna learn this in clinic. So if you're gonna go into this field, this is what you're gonna be doing. Posterior circulation, you're gonna do uh, AP axial and lateral, and here's how you position for that. So central venography, so there's two studies. There's superior uh, vena cavagram and inferior vena cavagram. So we rule out the existence of thrombus or occlusion of the central veins, it will not just demonstrate peripheral veins, but may be localized by filling defects. So um, we have the superior vena cavagram is performed by accessing, um, accessing axillary or subclave vein, and inferior uh, vena cavagram is performed by accessing the femoral vein and placing the catheter in the common iliac vein or inferior aspect of the inferior vena cava. So. Um, visceral venography is often visualized by extending imaging program from selected arterial junction. We rule out stenosis and thrombosis. So that's that. Here's your interventional procedures in cardiac catheterization. So your IR, interventional radiology, um, there's the percutaneous transluminal angioplasty the PTA, not like your school PTA. So you have the transcatheter immobilization, you have your inferior cave of filter placement, which is really important. You have your transjugular intrahepatic portal systemic shunt, which we call TIPS. So there's the PTA and the TIPS. Um, and we do other stuff also. So the PTA is therapeutic procedure designed to dilate or reopen stenosis or occluded vessels. So we can use balloon angi angioplasty and we can put stents also. So kind of cool. Transcatheter embolization involves therapeutic induction of various uh, substances to occlude or drastically reduce blood flow. They do this a lot for fibroids in the uterus. There's three main purposes. We will use it to stop bleeding on um, sites. So if a patient has a GI bleed, we'll also go in there and inject stuff to stop the bleeding 
It controls blood flow to disease or malformed vessels. They'll do this with cancer. They'll go in and block off um, blood to a tumor to shrink it. And there's inferior vena cava filter used to trap emboli, um, used to prevent pulmonary embolism resulting from deep vein thrombosis of the lower limbs. So as the thrombosis slides up and is heading towards the heart, we put in a filter and it breaks it up into a bunch of little pieces so the patient won't drop dead. They'll get short of breath, but hopefully not drop dead. So the filters are available in different sizes and shapes. It's delivered via a catheter system. So um, your TIPS procedure is created an artificial low pressure pathway between the portal and hepatic veins. It's used to reduce portal hypertension. So um, usually patients that have um, liver failure from alcoholism, they have varices, esophageal varices, which we talked about and they bleed so they'll go ahead it's because of the portal hypertension that these um, they're dilated and that they rupture and bleed so um, they'll do the tips procedure to lower the portal tension 10 pressure <laughs> portal and hepatic venous uh, venography is usually performed before the tips procedure so they'll run a whole diagnostic and then they'll go in and do the tips so uh, thrombolytic therapy is used to dissolve thrombus and intravascularly so they'll go in and actually if there's a huge blood clot in the lungs they'll go in and put a thrombolytic in there and try to dissolve the blood clot they'll do that in the brain also I've seen it in the brain so kind of cool um, they'll also use it to remove foreign objects like stones kidney stones gall stones uh, not fun so there's a snare um, at the end of it where they can capture the foreign object. All right, cardiac catheterization. It's a comprehensive term used to describe minor, minor surgical procedures involving introduction of special catheters into the heart, the great vessels, and the coronary arteries. There's both diagnostic and therapeutic treatments um, and depends on your consent and the condition of the patient if they're stable enough to be able to handle therapeutic. So general indications, uh, we look for the uh, anatomy and physiology of the heart. We look at the coronary arteries and um, we'll try to do repairs when we can. So general indications that we use is for uh, obstructive co coronary artery disease, thrombus, coronary artery collateral flow issues, coronary abnormalities, aneurysms, spasms, um, and arterial size, artery size, sorry. Um, general indications, uh, there's hemo hemodynamic data um, that can be performed so they can take samples of the blood in different areas so they can look at one side of the heart versus the other and look at the oxygenation of it. There's interventional procedures such as angioplasty and stent places, placements that can be um, performed during a single procedure. The risk factors, um, it's this slide cracks me up. The only absolute contraindication is refusal of the procedure by a competent patient and or lack of proper equipment. But then, look here! Look at all these contraindications. So, um, we need to be careful and check the patient's history, find out what's going on with the patient. It's really important that you know what you're getting into before you start working on this patient. So we need to know if there's an active GI bleed, there's um, acute or chronic renal failure. That is huge if we're given contrast, which we normally do. We need to know if they've had a recent stroke, if they have a fever, if there's severe electrolyte imbalance, if there's severe anemia, uh, shortened life expectancy due to the um, how gravely ill they are, and um, digitalis intoxication. Um, when we talk about digitalis, it's actually it's a cardiac drug. So don't be fooled. It's not the digits, your fingers and your toes. It is actually a drug. So um, digitalis is a my sister calls it, um, uh, what is it? It's like uh, ditch them or they're dead. So it's like the last ditch effort in order to save someone that's having a heart attack. So if they don't respond to anything else, you give them digitalis, and if they don't respond to that, pretty much they're dead. It's like dig your ditch with digitalis or something like that. <laughs> I don't know. She's a cardiac ICU nurse, and she has a pretty good slang for it. I was like, ew. Anyway. 
side note, sorry. So risk factors, um, here there's a ton. So um, the patient can refuse um, either therapeutic or diagnostic. They can refuse anything. So just so you know, um, we also um, look for severe uh, uncontrolled hypertension. Uh, it's kind of a big deal when we're doing this. Uh, we're looking for bleeding disorders. Uh, we need to know if they're on Coumadin. We need to make sure that their INR is correct, um, PTT. So there's acute pulmonary edema. We need to make sure that they're okay there, that their breathing isn't compromised. Uncontrolled arrhythmias, uh, endocarditis, and any kind of reaction to contrast. So there's a lot of risk factors involved with this, but it's a better than having your chest cracked open and having your heart displayed why they cut you open uh, and try to fix things so this is a better option but there's still it doesn't come without risk so uh, major complications um, we we are really really concerned about the uh, morbid patient there's um, the cardiogenic shock there's acute myocardial infarction uh, we have risk of renal insufficiency and cardiomyopathy uh, specialized equipment, um, it requires specialized equipment. You can use a C-arm, it's not the way to do it. You really need uh, to have a biplane uh, system, which is basically two C-arms that come together and work together so you can do AP and lateral at the same time. You have to have specialized catheters um, for uh, injecting, withdrawing, biopsying. Um, there's in when you have special catheters to even be able to maneuver to get into vessels. So um, there's balloons, there's ablation, there's all kinds of different things, um, catheters and equipment that we use. So um, there is also, let's see, we need really, really fast exposure times, um, 15 to 30 frames per second. That is really fast. So we need high resolution because we have to see really small vessels or structures and we have to be able to store all of this and it's so much data um, and it takes up so much space but it's so important that we retain all this data so a huge pack system alright so specialized equipment with monitoring the patient you need ECG and hemodynamics you need crash cart you need oxygen you need suction you need um, possibly to put in a temporary pacemaker. So um, my daughter does respond to a lot of studies where there's a chance that they might have to put in a temporary pacemaker or put in a pacemaker based on how the procedure goes. There's pulse oximeter, defibrillator, blood pressure cuffs, um, intraaortic balloon pumps that we can put in. Um, all this has to be handy dandy and ready to go because you never know what's going to happen and you need a uh, blood clotting time machine so don't ask me it's specialized equipment pre-catheterization care so you need to make sure you get a good history they need to have a physical exam you need to do a chest x-ray you need to do blood work they should have an ecg they should have electrocardiogram they should have a stress test before they come in and a cardiac perfusion study if we're doing any kind of um, work on their heart so um, we usually use the femoral artery when we go in. Um, we also can use the radio, brachial, axial, or jugular, or subclave. Um, when I say subclave, I'm talking about subclavian. And we can look at, um, through the catheter, we can do um, a data collection also. So uh, let's see, hemodynamic parameters. We're looking at blood pressure, cardiac output, there's intracranial and extra <laughs> intracardiac and extra cardiac pressures um, with special equipment. We can look at cardiac output and um, we can put a heart pump in if needed too. So we can take blood samples from different chambers like I talked about and look at the saturation levels and we can look to see if there's an intracardiac shunt um, that's not supposed to be there. So we do that a lot on kids. And um, with adults, there's um, basic diagnostic studies, there's left-sided heart catheterization, right-sided heart catheterization with kids, we look at congenital defects, um, procedures with age, we can look at heart size, type and extent of defects, and other um, 
different um, congenital pathophysiological conditions. Um, we're starting to use MRI more and more for these instead of taking them in because um, we can do it without contrast and just look at the blood flow within the heart and look at the muscles and everything else so we can measure output and all that good stuff within MRI. But it is a long procedure for a kid, so you have to sedate them on both studies. All right, so advanced di uh, diagnostic of vascular systems. So there's um, endomyocardial biopsies, so we can take tissue samples. Um, lots of fun. There's electrophysiology studies, uh, which we use on adults and kids, where we look at the uh, conduction system of the heart. Uh, we can induce uh, arrhythmias, which I am absolutely a nervous wreck every time they do that. My daughter laughs at me. She's like, Mom, we do it every day. We put patients into VTAC to see if the pacemaker is going to work. And I'm like, that's just not okay with me. I'm in the OR or in the cath lab. I'm a nervous wreck every time they do that. So we'll also evaluate uh, arrhythmias and determine the effect and treatment for arrhythmias. So they'll test different things to see what's going to work. And sometimes they ablate it and put in a pacemaker. So if there's a dysrhythmia, they'll just do an ablation and pace the patient. So interventricular cardiac procedures in adults, we do PTCA. There's intercoronary stents. There's um, uh, We can do ultrasound with uh, kids, we can do balloons, um, spectronomy, there's all kinds of stuff. So this is this whole PowerPoint is just scratching the surface. This is a huge department. They do so much stuff. So with adults and kids, they can put in pacemakers, uh, defibrillators, or ICDs, um, and they can do radiofrequency ablations. So post-catheterization care, we have to look at the site, keep it clean, it needs to be repaired, dressed, as needed. Um, they use special closing devices so that we don't have to hold pressure forever like we used to have to. Now it's completely sealed up, um, but we do need to make sure it's not dripping or draining. Um, Post-catheterization medications are prescribed by the physician and puncture site observation for hemorrhage or hematoma. We need to make sure that they're not bleeding internally or externally. The status of the distal uh, pulse is recorded. We make sure that we didn't completely block, block off the vessel, that there is still a pulse in the lower extremities, <laughs> that would be bad. Uh, we look at the vinyl signs and we watch the patients for uh, 24 hours, uh, typically if they're in the hospital, but if we're going to send them home, it's usually four to eight hours. And we encourage them to drink a bunch of fluid to flush the contrast out of their system, take their pain medication as needed. All right, so that's it. <sighs> I did it in 38 minutes. It's a big one, so I apologize. It was a lot. You're going to love it in there. It's a lot of fun.